This afternoon, we are going to continue through our series through the book of James, Faith That Works. And today, specifically, we're starting in chapter 2, and we'll be looking in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. We must go back and remember, in chapter 1, we saw that James is the half-brother of Jesus. We also saw that James was writing to the 12 tribes that are dispersed. Now he's talking about believers in Jesus Christ who are Jewish, who have been dispersed throughout the region. We know that they came to faith and then they, had, they were dispersed. A lot of people think of Acts 6 when Stephen was stoned. They think that that was the time when people just began to disperse. And so we think that a lot of the believers are from that experience. So in James, uh, James is writing to these believers, but he's not exactly writing anything new. This is something that they have experienced and, uh, and uh, understood throughout their childhood. Uh, so James is writing to the believers. If you'll look at with me in James chapter 2, starting in verse 1. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and say, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over, over there and sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil motives? Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he had promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man it is not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court. Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one part, he has become guilty of it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as you have spoken in your word, may you use this time to penetrate our hearts, to penetrate our souls, to understand your truth, to understand what you have for us, to understand and apply to our life. May we seek you and you only. At this time, Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So there are three commands that James writes about in this section of Scripture. The first is to show no favoritism. To show no favoritism. You know, part of us understands that and we can see that. A lot of us have probably even experienced times when somebody has shown uh, favoritism to somebody else that has caused disfavor towards us. So we understand that it is good to show favoritism to everyone, but yet it is still difficult. And James has been, uh, is not telling them anything new that they have not already seen, but yet he is re-emphasizing something that they should have been taught for a long, long time. Uh, take for instance, uh, look at Leviticus 19.15, it says, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor 
fairly. So James is bringing back up this teaching. This is something, do not show partiality. Do not show favoritism. Show people fair and equality. James, uh, even when we think about Jesus and His disciples, what was one of all the disciples, what did they care about? Jesus, which one of us is the greatest? Which one of us is your, your favorite? But Jesus continually cast that question aside because we are not to have favoritism. We are not to put people uh, differing uh, statuses ahead of other people. And James uh, illustrates this point in a significant way. He has this rich man and a poor man. The rich man is coming uh, in his Sunday best, so to speak. He is coming and he's, he's showing his wealth. He's showing what, uh, who he is, his status, everything. And then here comes a poor man who's dirty, just using the only clothes he probably only has. But look at the distinctions that is made. In verse 3, uh, we say, uh, we say, or excuse me, in uh, verse 3, the, James says, you stand over there and sit down by my footstool. This is the people welcoming this, this uh, poor man. And he's saying, come sit at my footstool. But the rich man, you go up to the front. You, you get the best seat. You, you stand over there, but you come sit at the, the footstool. That is so degrading to the poor man. So let's think about the footstool is basically like an ottoman that we kind of put our feet up and relax a little bit. But it also demonstrates significant power. And see, a lot of kings, they would have their footstools and they would have their enemy's pictures or their faces on that footstool to demonstrate their power, their authority over someone else. And someone welcoming in somebody into the church saying, hey, you come and sit by my footstool. Or if you want, you can go stand over there. But you're not going to sit in a proper seat. So James is illustrating something that is just powerful. Something that is something that we all can look at and say, that's just wrong. That is evil. And James is making the point and he's saying this because he's seeing it being done. He's hearing about it being done. He's not just saying this just to bring up an old teaching. He is saying it because it was actually happening. Do we find times in our lives where we are showing favoritism to someone else? You know, we must understand what this is. It's not just being nice to someone that say we see somebody that is in need. We go and we help them. It's not that we have to go and help other people uh, with the same need, whether they need it or not. But it is seeing something, helping them. But it is helping and showing favoritism towards one particular person while you're degrading somebody else. I'll never forget, we were in a uh, restaurant, we were, it was packed, and this was before COVID, obviously, but uh, we were waiting for our table, and uh, I was, we were standing, and I was, my legs and my back started to hurt, we were standing for a little while, uh, I, Courtney, I don't know how she was doing at the time, but probably not as good, probably uh, just like me, and we were just ready to sit down, well, we had the next seat to come up. And a, a group got up and left and, and they got their table and it was our turn. But before, some an elderly lady came in and she barely was standing up as it was. And I could see everybody looking because they knew it was our turn. They're looking at us, waiting for us to, to start going because if we weren't, they were ready to break. And I said, ma'am, would you like to have this seat? The, the older lady. It is not that I was showing her favoritism, but she had a need. It wouldn't hurt me or anybody else to stand up a little bit longer. So a lesson for your young men, young ladies, when you see somebody that needs a seat, let them have it. 
Let them see uh, the, the love of Christ uh, through you in that instance. So we see that, the, that James is referencing the, the rich man, the poor man. But what also did Jesus teach us? Jesus demonstrated such humility. When we think about the, Jesus washing the disciples' feet, this was something that a slave would do. Not just any slave. They would make sure that it wasn't a Jewish slave. They didn't want to degrade their own countrymen. They would want a Gentile, a Gentile slave to wash people's feet. But Jesus washed people's feet. He humbled Himself and He demonstrates to us that we must show the love to other people. We must be humble and show them and not consider ourselves more important than them. Jesus taught us taught us different. In verse 4, we see that uh, that they were uh, re basically judging people by, based off of their, their evil motives, their distinction, uh, and, and showing them that they were distinctive and, and that through all of it, what do we really want when we show somebody favoritism? We want them to, in turn, show us favor in one way or another. So we do something for them, desiring something back. And that's what they're saying. These rich men come to the church and they're wanting, oh, maybe they're going to give a good offering. Maybe they're going to give, uh, give us something. Maybe they will give us something in return just by being nice to them. And that's wrong motives. That's evil motives. But what did the rich men do? As what James is saying, the rich men would basically drag people into court. They would uh, def uh, blaspheme the name that which we were called. They were doing so many dishonorable things. And yet, the people still flocked and they still went and, and showed people favoritism. We are not to treat each other equally. No, we are, excuse me, we are to treat each other equally. This does not mean that we are to help someone in need that, and have to help everyone else in the same way. Regardless of need or not, but, we, but what it does mean is that if we see a need, we need to help the person regardless if we like them or not. The second command James writes about is to love your neighbor. James also states that this is the royal law. This is something that the king himself has given to us. King Jesus has given to us to follow. And we see Jesus saying this in Matthew 22. We see it in Luke 10. But Jesus is quoting from Leviticus 19.18. Uh, just a few verses down from where we saw the last uh, in Leviticus. It says, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now it's easy to love those that we like. It's easy to love those that we get along with. But it's really hard to love those that hate us, that persecute us. But what does Jesus say? We think about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Someone said, Lord, who is our neighbor? And he begins to tell about a man going down this road. He gets robbed. He gets beaten. He's lying down on the ground, barely alive. And here comes a priest, and the priest just kind of goes around him, not paying him any attention. Here comes a Levite. He does the same thing that the priest does. But here comes a Samaritan who was taught from the very beginning to hate that man lying on the ground. Not only does he pick him up and take him to a place to get, to, to, to get medical attention, 
He pays the man and says, if I still owe you any more when I come back, I will even pay you that. So who is our neighbor? It is everyone. And because everyone is our neighbor, no matter who they are, we must love them. And we must come to them and show them mercy. And do good to them. Because that is what Christ has called us to do. And still taking loving our neighbor, James takes it a step further. Look at verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point, he has become guilty of it all. So we ask the question, are all sins equal? Are all sins equal? Well, it's a yes or no. It's a yes and no. And what Christ has demonstrated for us through Paul, Paul says in Romans 6, 23, he says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. So that all sin brings us to, to the wage of sin, and that is death. It doesn't matter whether it's favoritism, a lie, any type of sin brings us to the judgment of God. But what is beauty, beautiful about that verse is it says, but the free gift of God is eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ. So any sin that we commit is sinful. It is separating us from God. Our standing with God is, is hurt. But sin towards other people is not always the sin. If you lie to somebody, it is completely different than if you killed somebody. If you lie to somebody, it will hurt them. It will hurt your neighbor. But if you kill someone, not only are you hurting that person, but you're hurting their family, their children, their, their friends. You're affecting a lot of people because of that particular sin. All of our sin is worthy of death before God. And all of our sin essentially affects our neighbors. So as we sin, we are not loving our neighbor because sin is selfishness. Sin is bringing things to ourselves and it affects our relationship with God as well as our relationship with other people. All sin is detrimental and it affects multiple, multiple relationships. Our sin impacts our neighbors, whether it is favoritism or lying or anything. We cannot love our neighbors and sin against them. The third command that James writes about is to show mercy. If we are living in the freedom of Christ, we do not uh, we, we do not have the audacity to hold things against other people. Because of what we have done, our missteps, our sin towards God, He has given us freedom. He has given us salvation. He has called us to come before Him and seek His forgiveness. And when somebody sins against us, we must also repay God and show, him, show them uh, mercy as God has shown us mercy. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we sin against God, we must confess our sins before God. But we don't always know the other person's heart. So if somebody sins against us, they should come and, and seek our forgiveness as well. As if you sin against somebody, you must go and, and seek their forgiveness. But if it doesn't involve you, we must not put anything on somebody else. For instance, I was a pastor 
uh, just just brand new at the church. I was just beginning to know people, getting to know their story, and 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 so forth. And I wanted to get uh, create a, a group of people that we could kind of talk, sit down and talk and figure out how can we connect with our, our community? How can we reach them with the gospel? So uh, we had this meeting. We were coming up with names of people that could fit in that group. So I mentioned one name and everybody was like, oh, not him. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> and, and they began to continue to tell all about the sins that this man had done. And what they had failed to realize is that the Sunday before the meeting, he had come down in front of the church, tears in his eyes, and he said, Pastor, I have sinned, and I need to get right with God. God had already worked in his heart. God had dealt with him. We must not put off our prejudices, our bias on somebody because we know of a sin they committed. If God is merciful enough to forgive people of their sin, we must be merciful enough to give that same mercy to other believers. We cannot hold people uh, hold judgment on people because of past sins. Now, if we know somebody that has been in sin and living in sin, especially a brother or sister in Christ, brother or sister in our, in our church, our body, we must follow Matthew 18. We must go to them. Say, hey, I'm seeing this. Are things right with you? Are you okay with God? Are you where you need to be in your relationship with God? If they say get lost, then you need to bring somebody with you and go again and confront them. And then if it continues, you go bring them before the church elders. And if it continues, you bring them before the church. That is what Scripture demonstrates for us. That if we want to be right with God, if we want to have a relationship with God, we also need to have a right relationship with one another because we cannot hold anything against somebody else um, when God has been so good to us. Let's look at Matthew 6.15. It says, But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. That takes it a step further. Not only are we going to have an issue with our own um, relationship with God, He is not going to forgive us of our transgressions. That's powerful state. Live in freedom. And James even calls it in verse 12, the law of liberty. It is to live in this freedom because Christ has died. Christ has already paid the sin debt for us. We must not just be arguing and fighting and complaining over sin because we are all fallen. We have all fallen and fallen short of the glory of God. But we must show mercy. We must not show favoritism to those, to, to, to anyone. But we must treat each other as equals, as one in the body of Christ. We must love our neighbor as ourselves. Christ has demonstrated for us this has been a commandment from uh, all the beginning since time. Those that we love, those that we don't uh, care for. We must love people because Christ died for them. God made them. They're the image of God. That is right. And that, that is what God has shown us. <clears throat> God said, be holy because I am holy. And if we really think about that statement, that puts a lot of weight on our shoulders. How can we be as holy as a holy and righteous God? See, God 
has given us His Word so that we can look and we can see how we are to act in certain situations when people cuss us out, when people fight us, when people show us disgust because we follow Jesus Christ. The urge that all of us have is that I want them to experience God. So I'm going to kind of show them God how they want to be shown. I'm going to not necessarily tell them this truth because I want them to see this part of God and not the full picture. God is perfect. We do not need to change the truth. We want to be appealing to the secular world. But the secular world is what crucified Jesus. We were a part of the secular world once. And God has shown us mercy. Not mercy by how we wanted to hear and feel and understand God. But God has shown us mercy by giving us His truth and who He really is. Let's show the world who God is. Let's show the world who Jesus is. And we do that not by showing favoritism, by showing love to our neighbor and showing mercy to one another.